I'm Alia Gina with the Haskane School of Business, representing the Trico Foundation Social Entrepreneurship Center today. And I'm excited to be hosting this session we lovingly call Amaze. Before we get started, and in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth, I would like to honor and acknowledge the Mukinsis and traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Pikani, as well as the Stony Nakoda and Sutina nations. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. Finally, we acknowledge all nations, Indigenous and not, who live, work, and play on this land, and who honor and celebrate this territory. Some of our speakers today are joining us from Edmonton, which is Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of the First Nations and Métis people. Together with you, the participants at today's event, we respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I can see that we have many attendees from all over the place, so please share where you're joining us from in the chat and acknowledge your territory if you know where, what it is. For those of you who have tuned in to Amaze before, welcome back. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. This is truly an Ask Me Anything style event with no formal agenda beyond offering answers to your questions about social entrepreneurship and sharing other resources you might consider. That being said, we rely on this audience's questions to drive the session's content. So if you have a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat now or as we go along as your thoughts come up and we will get started after some brief panel introductions. There are truly no silly questions, so please don't be worried. If you have a question, someone else probably does too. We'll invite you to unmute and ask your question to the panel but if you'd prefer, I can read out the question from the chat and that's totally fine too. So since this is an interactive session, we encourage you to turn on your camera. We also encourage you to engage in the conversation and share resources with each other in the chat, since this is also an opportunity for us to learn from you. And as you may have seen the red little dot in the left-hand corner, we are recording this session. Um, We've uh, compiled a YouTube playlist and I'll add that link in the chat as well. And so, like I said before, if, we, if you have a question, we're sure other people might have them too. As a reminder, though the panel represents many, many years of experience within the social entrepreneurship and social enterprise ecosystem, we'd like to remind you that this is not legal advice. Alrighty, so now let's talk about our panelists. Allow me to introduce you to Jane Bisbee, the Executive Director, Social Enterprise Fund, Brittany Kerluk and Dan Overall from the Trico Charitable Foundation, and Jordana Armstrong from um, Innovate Calgary. Okay, so now we're ready for your questions. I saw something pop up in the chat already. Thank you for sharing your uh, land acknowledgement. Okay, Sam, I know you put a question in the chat. Do you want to speak up, come off mute and ask your question? Sure, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I think it's great that people can get together and talk about things that are of mutual uh, interest and certainly of great social benefit. Um, my question relates to the issue of social capital. And I'm wondering what is being done about increasing the amount of social capital that's available in Alberta. And uh, I mean, not just for the large metropolitan areas, but the rural areas as well. Um, and if permitted, I can certainly speak to some context for that. Okay, hearing nothing, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead. <laughs> maybe maybe I can just give a little bit of background about some of the things that are going on right now. I mean, every fund in the 
province is certainly working towards raising capital one way or the other. Um, at the minute, there is also um, the mythical social finance fund, which is a pool of capital from the federal government is in final negotiation with the two English language um, wholesalers who've been chosen that will actually end up working with the on the ground social impact investors, so like SEF, to be able to um, put that capital to use. And the, the mandate really is to get beyond just the city boundaries into the rural areas as well. Um, there are also a number of other funds. There's just been a new um, uh, Black Entrepreneur Fund that's been announced. There are other pieces of capital going into uh, First Nations social finance intermediaries. So like the um, Alberta Indian Development Corporation and the uh, Indian Business Corporation, which are both funds here in the, in the province. So there is some movement that way. And something that's really important about the social finance fund. And I figure that we, I mean, I've already told the powers that be that I think we should get um, a, about 12% of that $400 million. Uh, it has to be met by, it has to be matched in some way by um, private uh, investment from other sources. So once that money's in place, I think a lot of people hope that it'll trigger more investors to um, actually step up and put money on the table. So that's sort of a high level answer, yeah. but there, yeah, there are things going on. I think uh, why I raised the problem is particularly the area that I work with is in the rural Alberta area. Um, and just to give some context, I have been working in social housing and seniors housing. And there is a great need in rural Alberta for community driven projects. So there's no trouble getting the community behind it. Uh, but we find that we don't have any private sector solution in the first place. Secondly, um, the government will only give about 50% grant, which leaves the rest to be borrowed. And the burden falls on the municipality and the taxpayers of that community, which are usually a small number of taxpayers, meaning it's a big impact or a trade-off for them. Sure. Um, there are not-for-profits that um, can operate in the space between, um, I guess you would say, charity and private sector, which is really the space, as I understand it, for social enterprise. Um, and with a business case, with a business case that could probably afford somewhere in the range of zero to five percent for borrowed money, um, certainly when rates get above five percent, it gets prohibitive. But um, just even accessing money uh, for a project, um, the reality is, is if there's no project, the need doesn't go away. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so we're trying to just find how how do we get social capital for these projects in the rural central Alberta or rural Alberta anywhere? Well, th this really isn't a commercial for the social enterprise fund. So let my colleagues speak too. But we do that kind of work. We, right. we we place capital with exactly those kinds of organizations. And the the other piece that I think is interesting is that I am being approached um in, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be making a presentation to uh, both municipal leaders and uh, community foundations in those smaller cities and the rural areas in Alberta around investing their capital in the kind of projects that you're that you're describing. So the truth of the matter is is that we're here and we're doing that. And so hopefully we'll be able to um, help finance what you're trying to do. Right. And I guess that's the interest, not that it doesn't exist, um, is that there should be more. Oh, um, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and it should be accessible. And quite honestly, in, in the area that I've worked in the last five years, particularly the last five years, most of the federal and provincial money has gone to the large cities. Yeah. Um, and so therefore, the gap doesn't get solved. Uh, the need doesn't go away. 
Um, but it makes all the sense in the world to keep uh, architects building uh, seniors housing and everything going even in a 5% world. Um, because if you can pay for your money, you're not asking for a handout, you're just asking sure. for some access to borrowed money. Yeah, so. and that's exactly the kinds of things that we've done both in the cities and the rural areas. Mm. Um, I Yeah, the, the current banking system is a challenge, particularly for nonprofits, um, mm. because most of the loans officers are kind of confused about some, right. of, the, right. um, some of the things. Right. Um, someone's put a um, question in the chat to me about the talk being open. Uh, I can ask them. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe email me directly and I'll make sure that we... Um, uh, let you know once that uh, is sorted out because I'm not there organizing it, not me. It's being organized by a couple of the community foundations, uh, Red Deer and Grand Prairie, and there's some others in it. Anyway, yeah. I'll I'll shut Jordana. Maybe you've got a comment about some of this. Well, I was just going to say, um, definitely letting Jane take the lead on that because she has the most experience, I would say, in that space and. This, in particular, in the context of this question, this should be an advertisement for the Social Enterprise Fund because they have exactly the kind of capital that can support that. Um, you've probably come, uh, Sam, across the Rural and Northern Communities Infrastructure Fund, which is looking yes. at digital infrastructure um, as well as physical infrastructure. And to your point, there, of course, is a match, but I'll drop it in the chat for folks who might not be familiar. Um, right. And then just a general comment I wanted to make around the concept of social capital, which I think applies to, um, it applies to rural communities as much as it applies um, to, to any communities, which is I am being, so Innovate Calgary has its history in the, the technology innovation ecosystem. And what I'm really constantly challenged by is working with some of the commercialization funders um, like the IRAPs, the Alberta Innovates to help them get their mind around the notion that, um, socially oriented enterprises create real economic value. And so when we're thinking right. of commercialization, um, we shouldn't be looking at jobs, economy, and innovation separate from um, this sort of the departments that fund the nonprofit and social service sector. And we need to see more advocacy at this like blended space. And so um, hmm. it's a challenge that we're not just seeing in rural communities in terms of social capital, um, but really that um, you know, that that intersection of enterprise and society um, are a lot more blurred uh, than we'd like to believe through our uh, departments uh, in, in various levels of government. But Yeah, and the last point I would make would be that, as you have highlighted, that there is a huge economic benefit to having projects proceed, even if they're in that zero to five percent return. Um, the option is not to do anything, which doesn't help anyone. <laughs> so you know, I don't see the rationale for doing nothing. Um, and I don't see the rationale for holding something because it won't climb a financial hurdle to make the project work um, because it's not giving a large enough return. Um, so I think the window I kind of carved out is kind of zero to 5% that most not-for-profits can serve social need and pay for the money they get within that range. Yeah. Uh, at least at least I've been able to put business cases together. And so I'm just raising the point about the need for more social capital because there are a tremendous a lot of projects that are just currently on hold. Yeah. There's um, and they're not helping anyone. So the, there's in a in a way, this is the, this room is the choir. We can <laughs> yeah. that that get that get that and what we have to as citizens is get that message to the various powers that be. Something that yeah. I've wanted to do is to try to shift the thinking, particularly around affordable housing, to using grants all the time. Why, in God's name, won't they, the governments, give us that capital uh, yeah. instead of giving it as a grant? Give it to us capital and then we can use it for one project and then it gets rolled to the next one when that one's up and running exactly and i think i think the five percent four to five percent range is absolutely reasonable if you can get uh provincial governments for example to allow their operating costs that they give to cover the cost of the building as well um yeah, I've, I've drawn them charts and figure pictures about it and and so far they're much more 
uh, interested in just giving the funding as a grant. And right. that's not always the best use of those funds. But anyway, yeah. it's a... And, and I do appreciate the fact that this is the choir who has, has, <laughs> has taken on the task. Um, I guess I'm entering as a newbie, but I've been working for not-for-profits my whole career and yeah. trying to do demonstration projects. And having demonstration projects just proves that it can be done. Mm -hmm. um, but the value of now for me is I'm at a frustration level where I need help and I realize I can't just do everything if I can't even get a project. Um, you know, I think the awareness and education to all the decision makers needs to be that there needs to be more capital available. And yeah. I'm just sort of raising that voice uh, to, along with your choir group. So. No, that's it, it, it's great. And you actually put your finger on something that's really, really, really key. Uh, right. And we should sit down and look at numbers sometime. I think we should pick some, yeah. push some things around and see what we can get done. Anyways, that's my biggest question in social enterprise. And thank you for the opportunity to ask it. Well, thank you for raising it. I appreciate it. I'll just plug one more resource for um, maybe like non-traditional financing. Um, that was developed by the government of Alberta through their uh, creative partnerships um, platform. And it's a crowdfunding Alberta based platform where the government, um, at least in the near term, will match some of that capital raise. So um, sometimes in community development projects, I'm not a, not always the biggest fan of crowdfunding because there are a lot of resources and thought that need to go into those campaigns. Um, but if you have um, a local community of involved retail potential investors that might be an option worth exploring either in your community or for others that are on the call and that and that might benefit. So I've dropped, dropped that link as well. Thank you. One one that thing that I just remembered, um, PV Mart has also um, just announced a grant program for rural small community development. Um, they probably, it's not enough money to finance a, a build, but it might do pay for the development phase of some of those projects. So you might want to take a look at what they, uh, what they're doing. Yes. And that raises the point that seed funding is also important for planning, yeah. not just, not just the build monies. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you also got some additional information in the chat about another crowdfunding lab. That's one of the great Excellent. things. So much information, so much knowledge sharing. Uh, thank you, Sam, for your question. Thank you, panelists. We're ready for the next question. Hi, could I ask a question? Yes. Christine, and I'm on an iPad, so I'm quite challenged to use chat at the same time. So if you don't mind me, and I'm not sure I'm at the, quite the right place for, for what I need to learn, but um, we're, I'm representing a small agency in Edmonton. It's food security and I'm also thinking poverty reduction kind of for um, uh, impact. And um, we, uh, our agency was chosen by some of three students from the Haskin School. And one of the students uh, referred me to this, this, uh, pop, this webinar. And um, so we're a very small agency and we're a traditional kind of uh, funded through grants and casino monies and that sort of thing. We're not a traditional charity in the same way we're, a, we're not for profit, but because we do a monthly food order and our, um, we have our members, we have members, not clients, and they order at the beginning of the month when they have money because most of our members are on fixed income. So they could be on age, they could be, um, um, on any kind of a pension plan and so or any kind of funding Alberta works funding so um, they order the beginning of the month and pay at the beginning of the month and then they get it delivered at the around the third week where they're usually out of money and out of food and so we do a wholesale uh, a relationship with a wholesaler and we do a meat order and a produce order and um, our agency is committed to funding the administration and the running of this so that we can offer the uh, food to the members at a wholesale price and they pay a $5 membership for the year. So we are not seen by a lot of the funding agencies as a traditional charity because we have a food order and we people pay. And so the fact that they are able to get probably 35% more value than they would if they went out to a store. Um, and the fact that they're not the normal demographic, 
Like these are people who are on pensions. Some of them are working poor and some of them are, there's a lot of singles and a lot of seniors that use the program. So we do about 600 orders a month and we've been doing this for quite a while. But one of the reasons we really went to Haskane also was our, our funding, our method of keeping this going is really not very sustainable. We only have uh, two part-time staff and we have volunteers doing the rest of the work. It's a very hands-on board and we're just burning out people. And the funding seems to get smaller every year. I've been involved with this agency for over 20 years and uh, we used to get bigger sort of grants and that. So it's been a real scramble over COVID to stay alive. We've gone to online, we've improved all of that, but um, uh, so I'm looking to see, is there another, should we be, how do we do something different in order to maintain the, the agency? So as I say, you guys are a little higher level <laughs> housing and whatever, but I think it's a really valuable program and I just don't see how we're going to survive if we, like we depend on CIP and casinos and we just, they're all three years. So you get your money for three years and you're only funded for two years. So you've got to fundraise and our members are not rich. They don't do a lot of, and we don't have, we're not like, we don't have a lot of people involved and the volunteers are mostly members. So, so the people use the program are volunteers. So that's where I'm at. I'm here to, to learn. Can, can I say something to start? You're, you're actually exactly at the right spot because what you, what you're struggling with is that you're, you're running a business and you need to figure out how to be able to make more revenue come in for you one way or the other and i think you need to talk to Brittany <laughs> um it, because it, it very social entrepreneurship is really about how do we take all the things we've learned that small business people have learned about how to run businesses better and apply them to exactly the kind of dilemma that you're in so if i can say Brittany, would you would you talk? Would you please help this? <laughs> yeah, I think what Jane's saying is perfectly uh, correct, and I think a lot of the pieces are um, is it's not even just about bringing business principles; it's also accessing things that you've done in programming and your other work that you've done. Right? Is is they're all skills that are going to help you lead to meeting your goals, right? And the thing I want to note is that. Every social enterprise model is going to have different pressure points, right? And so understanding those pressure points and, you know, what are the what are the pieces that are working and maybe the pieces that we're struggling with is really key. That's something we work with organizations around is sort of looking at what are the pressure points that exist within your model. Um, and in some cases, not every social enterprise is going to make a profit. And in many cases, they might not even cover the costs of the pro of the the offering that they're doing, right? And that's because you might be working with a population where those margins are really slim, right? So the fact that you are charging is is pretty cool, right? There's a lot of organizations that that aren't able to do that. So you've already sort of taken a step into that market place, but it's looking at like, what are those pressure points in those pieces? The other thing is, is like understanding, well, what are our, our goals? So if we have a good understanding of our pressure points, if we have a good understanding of what it costs and what we need to do in order to offer this program, then we can look at those pressure points and understand, well, how do we actually make that work? Um, and it could be that there might be grants or there might be other pieces that come into that. But I think it's always about being aware of how your model um, exists and then figuring out where do you spend your attention and your time, right? Especially as a, as a smaller organization. Um, the other thing is, is thinking about, you know, are there other organizations out there that are doing this already? And could we learn from them? So two of the ones that came to mind to me is Meals on Wheels. So how does Meals on Wheels actually have that operate? Are all of their costs being covered by the people purchasing those meals or is it subsidized somehow? What does that look like? So at Trico, we really firmly believe in um, industry knowledge and learning from people who have been there and done that, right? So is there something that you could learn 
from an organization like Meals on Wheels about how they balance that. And, and maybe they're doing, maybe they're in the same spot as you. I don't know, right? Um, but like there could be some interesting learnings to share there. Or the other one is there is an organization in Calgary called Fresh Roots. And so Fresh Roots is a mobile grocery store, but what they do is they go into food deserts and communities that have limited access to fresh food and they sell things at that base price, right? And what does that look like and how do maybe they handle some of those pressure points that within their models? So um, we have a program called Assess that we work with organizations across Alberta um, that's really focused on um, how do we support organizations that are bringing together the social and the entrepreneurial, right? And how do we help them sort of understand those pressure points and help them be as prepared as possible to move their idea forward in the safest way possible? Because that's the other thing is, is that you, you've got an organization that you want to protect. You're working with a, a vulnerable population and you want to support that population, um, but we really work with organizations to say, well, how do you move that idea forward as safely as possible within that affordable loss zone? Um, and how do you learn along the way so that if you are spending, putting out resources and trying things, you're getting that feedback as quickly as possible. Um, so we also do granting to charitable organizations that are looking to try something to experiment in that space as well. So I would say check out our resources and see if they would be a fit. It's all available online for free 24 seven and always happy to chat like specifically about some of the challenges that you're having. Um, but it's one of those places of, of figuring out where your pressure points are and, and what's what are your goals and then figure out the model that makes the most sense for you long term so that you hit whatever your sustainability goals are. Jordana's unmuted, so we don't let her jump in. I would actually just second the comment that Jane put in the uh, chat box. I was going to say a similar thing, like building on Brittany's point around what you can learn from other models. I think um, something I heard you say as well is um, burnout and staff turnover. And so is there a potential opportunity in partnership with some with other organizations that have shared values and similar objectives um, to be able to partner to deliver uh, like services in an ongoing way um, while thinking about like how to optimize the staff resources that you have. Um, I'll just share on burnout. I'm currently sitting in our wellness room because we are trying to um, share a message that, you know, there, there is a lot of work to be done, um, especially as change makers, and we have to be taking care of ourselves. I'm also just needing okay. to take care of myself today. So um, I, yeah, I, I appreciate and recognize that balance. Um, and then last resource I wanted to plug, certainly assess, and we love the work that uh, Trico Foundation is doing, um, and would also add there is... Um, the Social Impact Lab Alberta, which is now scaling up and they have a program called Inspire, which is specifically for social service agencies and, uh, and uh, organizations in the social profit sector to think about um, specifically innovating around their users and around their, um, so I think, um, you know, a complementary set of tools um, to what uh, Trico offers. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jane. I'm taking care of myself right now, being with all you people and um, sharing these uh, insights and learning from you. So thank you all. Can thank I you. push the partnership question just one little step further? Understand you're bringing something to the table as well, right? You're not just taking, you're not going and asking any of these other organizations, oh, can you save us? It, like the organic box or cultivator or fresh roots um, need customers and you have customers. Yeah. And so they're, so, so go to it with really with an open mind about what you're bringing to the table as, and what you're contributing in doing this. Um, if you're not just taking from them, you're, you're bringing what might be a solution to them. Mm -hmm. Um, which is which is an important thing for uh, I think a lot of small organizations and not for profits don't always remember that about themselves. And I think our organization is just coming to that those kind of thoughts. Like we haven't the board hasn't really entertained those ideas. I'm maybe a bit ahead because I do the fundraising. Yeah. And the real the reality. So yeah, six hundred yeah. new paying customers. <laughs> Do you know what it costs you to get 600 new paying customers if you go through a traditional marketing plan? <laughs> you know, you've got something of value there. 
Mm-hmm. And, but and it's hard to that. find a, it's hard to find the same kind of values because we don't have clients and we don't give away food and people have they want they feel good about what they do they feel they have, they have dignity and so it's yeah so it, that so it's so it's, it's good to yeah yeah it's not so much that you're trying to get somebody to give you the money to do it although yeah. that will come that's part of it but if you're going to work with some of the other food security delivery or even local food providers think mm-hmm. about how what you can bring to the table as mm-hmm. a as a business um just the slight change of mindset. Well, I think that's a really great point in terms of finding alignment, right? And the importance of finding alignment, right? You want somebody who shares your goals um, as closely as possible, or you need to figure out what your boundaries are in terms of, of what you're comfortable with, right? Because if you're partnering with someone, they're going to ultimately represent you as well. So you want to make sure those pieces, but I think that piece around Um, you're also bringing something to to the table. Um, And a lot of it could just be the knowledge of your organization existing in the work that you do um, is really key. Thanks for that great question. Um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong panel, uh, Fresh Roots is also expanding to Edmonton. So they might be, and Christine, you said you're in Edmonton, right? Okay, yeah, so that might be a closer connection. It's and, been an on again, off again thing. Uh, but who fair. knows? It might be on again. Okay. Well, and I was going to say that, um, Jane, to your point around uh, what organizations bring, they've been looking to do that for for a number of years, and so that might also be just a really aligned uh, conversation at a minimum. Yeah, the pandemic kicked the um, feet under a number of these kinds of things. It's been really tough. The food food for good as well at Jasper Place Wellness Center has been having challenges. So it, it is an area we really to get our heads around. I guess the pandemic also highlighted this need, right? Thank you for that great conversation. Um, Did you want to follow up? Did we answer your question, Christine? If not, we'll go to the next. No, I'm good, thank you. And we have, I think, made one reach out to Jasper Place, excuse me, Wills, but thank you. Okay, we're ready for the next question. Audience, it's your turn. Hi everyone, thanks so much. Um, So I guess my question falls in sometimes, I'm a bit of a hybrid model. So, and I wondered what your thoughts were about that. So my business is for profit, but it also generates funds for community impact. So we're trying to generate um, basically community impact funds through gameplay such as Pokemon Go and things like that. And so I am wondering if that kind of elite, like leaves me out of a lot of the granting and funding because I am a for-profit and if the social enterprise field wouldn't be necessarily for me. Go, Jordan. Um, I would just start with, um, I think a lot of folks on this call, but also in the broader um, social enterprise and social finance community, um, in particular in Alberta, are pretty agnostic to form of incorporation. Um, I know for my for the fund uh, that we manage, you see social impact, um, same with social enterprise fund, uh, will invest in for profits, not for profits, um, ch- charitable organizations. And what we really want to see is does that form of incorporation make sense for what you're doing, and does it make sense um, for where you're raising most of the money? Um, I would say, yeah, so for me, I actually think non for profits are, are a great thing because it's a flexible model that allows you um, to have control over your governance and um, allows you to access different forms of capital. In fact, you have a more expansive ability to access different forms of capital. Um, the only other thing I would say about that is, again, hearkening back to the comment I made earlier, for a for profit um, with revenue in particular if you're doing something tech enabled um if you're not doing something tech enabled there are i would say more barriers from a non-dilutive like granting perspective because you're not going to be um for for foundations who have restrictions on investment that presents challenges but there is non-dilutive grant capital available for uh, ventures um building um building um sustainable business models so i mentioned a few of those alberta innovates 
um, IRAP, our, our funding opportunities that can help you bring on staff. Um, there's the Jobs and Growth Fund uh, that's just emerged from Prairies Can. Um, so just a few things that you can look at. Um, but again, the challenge with that is they're often looking at tech enabled and that's something that we are certainly advocating them um, to kind of push boundaries around. Um, so those would be my initial comments, Jane, pass it over to you. Yeah, I, I'd say for-profit, non-profit, it, it's, it's not really um, the point about whether you're a social entrepreneur or not. It's around how do you, how do you, how are you in community? Um, is more of what, for example, we look at um, when we're investing is, and, and as Jordana said, is the structure that you've got the right one for you actually be to um, organize and deliver your business in an efficient, in an efficient way. I'm hoping we get to a point where, you know, all businesses and all the economy are taking their impact in community and, and their responsibility um, it, to change things uh, for the better uh, as part of what they're doing. So I, I don't think I don't think being a for profit cuts you out of it. It's about how you um, how you treat your stakeholders, how you treat your employees, how you treat the environment, all of that kind of thing is so you're not being cut out. Jordana's right, then you have to then start doing some research as to what are the um, what are the what are the things that turn the crank of whatever the granting agency is that you may be um, approaching or what are their limitations just because of their structures? Uh, so I, I would say being a social entrepreneur is hurrah. Um, I think the more we can get everybody to that point, the happier that that will be. Um, and it doesn't cut you out of out of being part of the social enterprise world. I will. I one of the resources we haven't really talked about is Nomada. Nomada.ca, which is um, I've been created. It's in its early phases. We've still got a lot of work to do, but it is intended as a resource for social entrepreneurs to find out all about the support services available in the province for them. And and the government has said they will put all of their resources up as well. Um, so there's a bit of work to be done on that part of it, but hopefully it will become a good resource that will give you some ideas that are focused on the kind of work that um, that you're going to do. Stop there. Brittany or Dan? Yeah, I would just add, um, so we as an organization always say that uh, form should follow function. So choosing the right structure that will allow you to achieve your goals, whatever they may be. Um, and that there's a lot of different ways to have social impact, right? So um, there's many different ways, but many different models that organizations use where social impact is a key part to the work that they do. Um, however, the fly in the ointment, which has been touched on a little bit, is um, Jane talked about sometimes foundations have limitations to their own structure. So for example, Trico Charitable Foundation at this time only funds charitable organizations. And that's what's available to us from CRA for grant making. We don't do things like loans. Um, and so I would just flag that. So I think probably having those conversations with as many, like the people that you're sort of looking to talk to about funding is most um, people will be quite honest with you to say, hey, this does fit, this doesn't fit, whether it's legal structure reason or if it's focus reason. Um, and the other thing to think about is there there may be some change, well, there have been some changes put in, in terms of legislation around that recently, but uh, as far as I know, the guidelines are not final finalized. So um, other foundations and stuff might be making some changes to who they can and cannot support coming down the line. And I was just add, I was going to mention the matter too. And the matter actually specifically says whether each of the offerings, if I recall correctly, uh, are open to not-for-profit, for-profits and things like that. So in terms of your specific question, the matter would be a particularly great resource. That was really fantastic. Thank you so much for that information. Okay, to keep our juices flowing, I will ask one. So the question is, when should you consider financing and investors? 
Is it a growth strategy or could it apply to startup as well? I feel I like you're done. Last time, Jane, you go first this time. The answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes, but um, it, it's a matter of there's so many things to be to be considered. Um, it comes down to what do you want the money for? Like you're buying a resource to make something happen, right? So it, it depends at where you are. We have, we have done loans to things that were almost a complete dead startup, like right from nothing. Um, it's, it's a scary place for someone like us who does primarily loans, but we have done it. Um, but it's not all, it's not, it, it really depends on an analysis of what you need the money to do and, and, um, and what your own capacity is to meet the expectations of the investor, regardless of what those might be, whether it's long-term or short-term or whether it's mission. I mean, and in this case, I would even consider a lot of grants as investment, right? And that it, it's a government or an agency wanting something to happen. And so they could be investing you in you as, as much as a seed grant that they're not going to take back. Um, forgivable loan or, or uh, forgivable equitable uh, equity investment. It's, um, it's, it, it's hard to give a specific without some more details other than say, yes, <laughs> it can be done. The only thing I would add to that is um, pending the type of capital that you're raising. Um, in particular, if you're raising um, equity investment, di what we call a dilutive investment, one thing you want to be attentive to is that um, the clock starts and what you do with that money, future investors will consider. So sometimes um, we'll work with a potential investee um, to get them to a place where they're really able to execute on the milestones that they propose um, with that capital. And again, that changes a little bit um, with the type of investor, um, like dilutive uh, uh, investments are, are significantly different than non-dilutive investments and the lens through which um, sometimes those investments are, are, are viewed. Um, I'll give an example with an equity investor, how do you get your money out? Um, you get your money out from that company being acquired and or more investors uh, coming in. And so there's there's a particular pathway that's being considered um, on the um, non-dilutive front. Of course, if it's a loan that's getting paid back, if it's a, a royalty, that's a, another agreement in itself. And so um, just considering sort of um, what's the landscape look like in that particular investment structure is also going to shift um, sometimes the timing. But uh, in particular, in the equity space, it's important to know that a clock does does start. I, I'm go I'm going to I'm going to push you a little bit on the inside baseball language you're using to a slight extent there, because um, people don't often think about what are you giving up, and so yet you're absolutely right in what you say about. But it it really comes down to if you're on the uh, receiving end of this investment. You, you had to think about what does the investor expect? And what Jordan is talking about, about the, the clock starting ticking and the exit, that's what the investor is thinking about. If they've put equity investment into venture capital, all those kind of languages, if they put money into you, they are thinking about how do I get it out with a profit? So that's, and, and so you need to be thinking about that too in a very clear way what are what are their expectations and when are they you know when's the hammer going to come down it's not free money it really isn't and what so what are their expectations and on how many levels do they have expectations and in what time frame also you have to think really carefully about that kind of investment about what are you giving up are you giving up ownership if the investor's expectation is that their exit relies on somebody coming and buying out the company. That means you're growing a company for somebody else. And that may not be what you really want to do. So you need to be really clear eyed about that. I have had a lot of early stage investors show up at my door because they don't want to give up ownership. They want to keep 
100% of the ownership in their own hands till it gets to a point where they actually maybe know what the hell the thing's actually worth. Because you hear this question, what's the valuation? You're going to become evaluated at a billion dollars if you have this investment. Well, um, yeah, how much ownership do you still have of that? And what have you had to give up? So you really do need to, when you're thinking about what kind of money that you're going to put in and what kind of money you're going to go after, really think about the expectations of the investor. What do they want from you? Do you like what they're doing? Do you like them? Uh, and what do you have to give up to get that money in terms of control and ownership? Now, it might be worth it, but you should t really take a look at it that way. That's really simply what it comes down to. That aligns exactly with what I wanted to say, too, is in terms of like what your goals are. There's different types of money. There's different types of financing. There's different types of loans and grants and things like that all come with different pros and cons that you'll have to kind of weigh. Um, and ultimately it's owning your own journey and figuring out what your goals are and what aligns with that. Um, and one of the things is, uh, this is Kathy Clark who talks about it, but almost like the understanding of like, you might be kind of in a canoe right now, but a venture capitalist or um, somebody that you might go to for money might be looking for a speedboat, right? And so how do you maintain the control that you want to have on that journey. And a lot of it is aligning goals and, and ensuring that the type of money that you're looking at aligns with what your goals are. I just wanna add one more point to that, um, which is like at the center of what Brittany and Jane are saying, um, at the end of the day, you're building a relationship. And so um, as much as, and I love the point you made, Jane, because you're, 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 you're in, ex you're in effect exchanging value. And there is there is a lot of money in the market right now. So there are a lot of investors in the non-dilutive and dilutive spaces that are, are looking for um, the right deal. And that could be you. Um, but at the end of the day, um, just like the partner you choose um, in, in a relationship, you, you really wanna make sure that there is a dating process. And so um, one core thing that we often differentiate when we are talking to nonprofit or social profit leaders who are used to uh, the grantor relationship um, is to emphasize that uh, agnostic to the type of funding, in my experience, an investor wants to see you coming and they wanna be building a relationship. And so it's not too soon to start the conversation. You can start the conversation before you may be ready. And that's part of you also um, doing some of that uh, relationship building that you need to do to create that relationship that Brittany and, and Jane are talking about. Can you remind our audience what the differences between dilutive and non-dilutive funds, please? Sure thing. Um, so it, this is in particular in a for-profit context. Um, and in a for-profit context, um, you have a capitalization table, and when you bring on equity investors, they're buying ownership in your business in exchange for the capital that they're putting in, and that dilutes um, that dilutes the ownership that other um, folks on that cap table have. Well, I'm going to drop a really friendly link in the chat, uh, which is a nice uh, resource called Slicing the Pie. So I think a lot of uh, folks who are raising um, dilutive capital uh, sometimes are afraid of of uh, that concept, but really, the, in theory, the pie grows. So, um, and that's a, that's a particular um, approach. And then I'll let Jane, who's eager to speak, uh, speak. I, to I would just, I was just going to say, you've all, you've if you've watched Dragon's Den, you've seen it in action. We need X number of dollars for Y percentage of our company, and that's essentially what it it comes down to. Yes, there's there's more layers to it than that but that's the quick that's the quick uh, example you've probably seen in action so i do want to add some color to that because um, <laughs> if you are at an early stage and you're raising dilutive capital there are there are ways that investors approach that to not have the valuation conversation so I don't think most dilutive capital is exactly like that scary dragon's den um, because it's not always about maximizing financial returns, but they're, um, yeah, I'll drop the slice in the pie reference in there. And um, and there are ways to defer that de uh, evaluation conversation to later when you're quite early. Um, Jane, I'll pass it back to you. Did you wanna speak to non-dilutive funding? 
you're on a roll, go for it. Uh, okay, so the opposite of that is it doesn't dilute ownership. Uh, think about loans and, and grants. Um, that's the quick summary. I love it. Great um, building on questions, question after question. That's great. Um, audience, back to you. A question from you? Um, I was actually just wondering, so you had talked about like what your client or your, your investor is looking for, but from a granting perspective, like Alberta Innovates um, and those different grants, what what would be what would be their interest and what are they looking for and where would you find that information? Well, I'll use government as an example, because back when the earth was still cooling, I worked for government. Um, the first place you look is in what's the policy of the government of the day. And also every grant program inside of government will have an opening whereas this is what we're trying to address. This is what we're trying to change. And almost every granting program from any organization that grants either has that opening um, uh, whereas statement, or you can take a look at what they as an organization have set out as their mission and what they're trying to change. I, I think it's really kind of, I always found it amusing where people didn't do that homework before they actually apply to grant. I used to give a 10 commandments of grantmanship um, uh, presentation and commandment number one is they need you as much as you need them. Because the reason they're there is to give out money to, to change something or to do something or to accomplish something. So they need you as an applicant to carry that thing out. So, so you need you just you need to do your homework on each individual granting agency, department, whoever, and the grant itself, what it's aimed at. And that's why reading that all that stuff at the beginning of the proposal and not just going right to the filling out the form is really critical because you're wasting your time if you're you know if they really want to support um growing sheep and you're trying to grow goats you know they may you may not get anywhere just to and do you uh, think it oh i just wanted to follow up and just ask like is do you know if it's um Similar to like the new way they do resumes where there's lots of buzzwords and stuff that a computer picks up because there's thousands of applicants or do you, is it still humans reading things? <laughs> that's a that's a good question. I haven't come across anybody who's, but my colleagues may have heard something. I haven't come across anybody yet who's gone quite that far uh, of having, but I, I know that there are, there is some dismay from time to time in in having to trying to find people to appraise grant proposals because there's a lot of stuff that comes that isn't isn't relevant um, or who hasn't that hasn't paid attention. Uh, we, if you find, I've sat in those places, you know, where you've got a hundred things you've got to read in the next two days, and um, if you find one that actually answers all the questions in a succinct way that actually is relevant to what it is that you're doing, the grant proposals are not generally um, appraised by weight. <laughs> and you would be surprised at how much stuff gets added to it um, uh, sometimes to make it appear more relevant. And that's not helpful. Um, as succinct and answering the questions as directly as possible is really, really important. And it's like you've died and gone to heaven when you find that really great proposal um, that speaks to what it is you're actually trying to do and has good, clean backup material that is um, straightforward. I, I remember the last time I got age payables on a proposal, I just about cried because you don't see sometimes those really relevant pieces of information that you actually need. So, I, I see Jordana. I was just gonna add, cause Joanna specifically referenced um, one of them, all three links, NRC, um, the IRAP program, Alberta Innovates and the um, Prairie Scan Jobs and Growth Fund, they all have 
humans, human advisors that will work with you to both determine eligibility and then to actually complete the applications. Um, that's maybe probably quite like unique, uh, but of those three programs, please contact the humans first because <laughs> they don't want to see an application until it comes through a human. Yeah, and I would just add, um, like as a grant maker, um, uh, my goal is to actually make it as easy as on you as possible because that makes it easier on me, right? So, and easier on our team and anybody who's making decisions. And so I've heard from some foundations that have asked me like, what do you guys use to kind of like, is there something that'll help us just like pull out the ones that don't fit? Um, we haven't found anything, we go through them. But our goal as a foundation has always been to like, try to weed those out as soon as possible with you, with you wasting the least amount of time possible. So um, one of the things that we have done is rather than having organizations complete an entire application, um, we have an idea submission process which should take under 10 minutes, which asks a few key questions and helps us at least just do an initial gut check, does this fit? So we had talked about how Trico funds charitable organizations. Well, the first one's what's your charitable number? And if you don't have a charitable number, that should be a sign that probably don't want to go ahead. Um, and then also like happy to chat with organizations just through a quick email to say, hey, does this fit? Does this not fit? And sometimes I don't even know um, what my funding committee is going to be excited about and what's going to work for them. So sometimes it's worth just doing that 10 minute idea submission because we can take it and then actually have some really cool conversations, learn more about what's happening in this space. And hopefully uh, we try to get back to organizations within 10 days as well. So um, there's lots of pieces, not not the whole process, Jane, not the whole process in 10 days. But um, like I know that um, as someone working in this space is we don't want to waste anybody's time. And so like our goals always try to be as supportive as organizations work with organizations the best way possible, even in our application processes, we actually don't often use a full application anymore we actually ask them for what they have already and try to work from what's already been prepared by the organization rather than having them complete something for Trico so I think having that like Jordana said that one on one conversation with the actual humans is it's usually worth either that call or if they have something really quick and easy, check it out, but also read what they have because I have tried to be as clear as possible <laughs> about what does and what doesn't work. So for example, you see that, what is your charitable organization number as the first question on an application for specific grants we have, but you wouldn't see it in something else we were doing where we're not restricted in the same way. So um, trying to be as communicative as possible for sure as well. You're also going to, like if you're targeting specific organizations you want to go after for funding, you're going to have to be a bit of a detective. So as Jane says, step one is just look at what they actually request in their application, but go to their website, see what organizations they celebrate that they're funding and see what characteristics and whether that's a match as to what you're about or their annual report, how they talk about things they're excited about, or maybe going to their events and speaking to people who have successfully gotten funding, right? So you're gonna have to do a bit of sleuthing if you're targeting a potential funder who could be really crucial to funding you. Awesome, thank you for that. Thank you so much. Awesome, awesome discussion. I'm loving it. I've missed this. All right, audience, back to you. Do you have a question? Another question. This is Sam. I have a question. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's just part of my learning um, because I see a lot of uh, grayness in the area called social enterprise. So I'm, I'm asking this question because maybe I had the incorrect uh, assumptions going in. Um, if it's not a particular organization type, um, if it's not a particular space between not-for-profit and private sector, and it crosses all the boundaries, could I ask people to simply give me their definition of what social enterprise is so I can get educated? Because 
Um, it's not a charity, it's not a not-for-profit, it's not private sector, but it could be something about the purpose for which the funds are being used, I guess. Dan, I have to we have to pass this one to you because we always use your definition. <laughs> uh, Trike Foundation's definition is uh, using business models, which is selling a product or service to serve a social need. Now, the challenge with asking someone what their definition of social enterprise, which is what you should do, is you now have one person's definition of social enterprise. So you're going to have to be very careful of if you're looking at a particular funder or a particular program, you're, or even like, for example, the federal government, which is involved in social enterprise a lot lately, you're always going to have to look at their particular definition of social enterprise. So just because you hear one, don't think that you have anything other than one person's definition of social enterprise, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I have laid awake nights trying to think about how do I change the name of our fund because the term social enterprise kind of makes me nuts exactly for what Dan has, has described. And I'm I'm to the point, and forgive me those who heard this before, where I don't think of it as a noun, I think of it as a verb. So social entrepreneurship is how you work within your organization regardless of corporate structure to actually do good in community. And I think it's a really, it's a fabulous set of tools to help us um, improve how nonprofits, for-profits, whatever, actually operate in society so that ultimately we can change the economy so it becomes more inclusive for all Canadians. And to build on Jane's comments, which we completely agree with at Trigo, that's the, the really interesting conversation is not, are you a social enterprise, but how far could you go in serving social needs if you fully harness the power of business models? So it's that, it's not just a, oh, hey, I'm a social enterprise because um, we're hybrid or we're mingling the social and the entrepreneurial. It's how could you make the most of your business model to fully serve these social needs? That's where the conversation about social entrepreneurship starts to get really, really interesting and possibly game changing. And I have nothing to do but add asterisks to both of those astute comments. So I guess my my sense of it being ambiguous is probably not too far off. I appreciate the reassurance. Thank you. Well, and I would just add too is that's kind of fun too, right? Because there's lots of different ways and different tools to use to have social impact. Um, and so we used to talk to organizations and they would go like, this is not a social enterprise, right? Or this is a social enterprise. And you'd spend like a lot of time <laughs> talking about it. Um, and that's like Dan said, that's not really what's interesting. It's more about like what you could do with it. Um, and so we talk a lot about the different ways in which organizations can have social impact. And I think what's really important in this space is also to understand that organizations and the tools that they use are going to change over time and they're going to evolve over time. And so um, sometimes people don't like, for example, I give a portion of my profits to a social cause and I'm a social enterprise, or I use a buy one, give one model. Um, but that doesn't mean that's what an organization is going to do forever. It also doesn't mean that it's not the right tool to have the social impact that they want to have. Um, and I think that's what's really interesting about this space is that there is no box, um, but also can be hard sometimes when you're kind of trying to locate yourself in the space and, and describing it to people as well. You, Brittany, you reminded me of one of our clients who are in a rural, small rural community in Alberta who, who are determined that they are not a social enterprise. And I've put money into them. So somewhere along the way, I thought they were. Um, they, they don't use that language, but they very much do what Dan said. They looked and said, how do we use better business practices to change what we want to see in community and to benefit our local community? And, um, and so that's what they did. So as far as I'm concerned, they're using social entrepreneurship principles. They're just not using the language. And I, I kind of don't care in a way, as long as the, as long as the good gets done. And again, it, it really is just about that creativity. And I'll, I'll give you like an example. And 
This is one that's quasi-residential because of your particular interest. So we have a social enterprise award nationally. And one of our recipients was Squatch Eye Lodge. And initially they are in Eastside Vancouver, very challenged, impoverished area. They wanted to kind of generate revenue for their indigenous organization. So they wanted to create a hotel that had a sweat lodge. And they looked into that, no interest in customers. So they went back to the drawing board and they said, well, okay, what if we get indigenous artists to create unique rooms in each room in the hotel? And money that we generate from this, we then fund a residential program for other indigenous artists. And then on top of that, we have the indigenous artists as well as other indigenous artists have a, a kind of gallery that's on site in the hotel. And this has been phenomenally successful for them. So again, it's that kind of, how do we combine our values, what we want to accomplish and tap into actually market. And again, just think of the creativity and the, the synergy between those various elements of social impact and business model and how it all fits together. So it's, it's trying to train people and inspire people and provide them the tools to have that type of journey of saying, you know, where is the, the combination of the blend between the social and entrepreneurial and our particular model and how far can we take this? I just want to make one other comment because I think it's worth, um, I need a better analogy than beating that horse dead. Um, but I think it's just worth driving home, um, which is uh, for us, uh, we don't like to get too caught up in, in the definitions. And in fact, there are lots of good ones out there. As we said, we really like trichos. Um, what, what matters is at the end of the day, who are your stakeholders and what do they care about? So who are your customers? What do they care about? Who are those potential investors? What do they care about? And are you using resonant language in terms of what you're doing? And I think that was really interesting to me. I just, I'm going to Vancouver. So I just was reminded of, of the hotel um, and uh, might stay there, Dan, let you know how it, how it was. But I, when I uh, grabbed their website to drop in the chat, I was really fascinated in how they, um, the language that they use. Um, and we very rarely see pitches on our end that are, we're a social enterprise that blah, but we do sometimes see that. And sometimes that will resonate with a particular audience or a particular um, stakeholder. Okay. Well, thank you. You've uh, brought some clarity to my ambiguity. So thank you. Uh, additionally, I've heard that every room is different. So you may have to stay multiple times at this hotel. Um, I also added a link to a webinar we had done a little while ago about different business models within social enterprise. So that might be interesting for you to look at as well. Yeah, okay. and just to clarify yes. that I've I've kind of been working from projects and models that solve social needs that already exist in not-for-profits and really incrementally making them more viable, sustainable, and more of a benefit. Um, so I guess I was entering the space, as you might call it, from the not-for-profit and making it a better not-for-profit. And I was just having a question about uh, how do I use the social enterprise language to get more people involved and maybe even get more capital, which was my original question. Thank you. Thanks for asking a question again. Sorry, I'm uh, jumping yeah, in, Ali. Sorry, I just wanted to add, I'm gonna throw in the box, uh, the chat box too. Um, we have like a 28 minute video, which is like not 10 hours of curriculum, um, but that goes through some of this language stuff around the potential of social entrepreneurship and also different ways in which organizations are using business models and talks through a few examples. So I'm gonna throw that in the chat box as well, if you're interested. And Sam, I would really encourage you to look before you leap, before you use the term, because for sure you're going to get some that love social entrepreneurship, but most people are going to be turned off by the social because they have a business perspective and the social people are going to be turned off by the entrepreneurship business side because they're going to think you're just about greed. So be very careful when you use one of the curses of being the best of both worlds is you're rejected by the way. The yeah, often, oftentimes when I've mentioned the project, they understand what I'm doing. But when I enter the language, I just get a blank look. <laughs> you see Anyways, all the thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you again, Sam, for the question. Um, 
and we feel your pain. <laughs> okay, so the question is, where and how do you find fabricating companies? If a project needed something like a small metal or cardboard box, how do you find a maker or supplier? I, I was going to say that's actually a tricky one for me to answer. So if other folks have recommendations, um, we um, have proposed the idea to various uh, folks like Out of Mars um, to create like a, a Canada-wide network um, because recognizing that Canada is a really small market in terms of being able to access suppliers, manufacturers, um, and, uh, and, and other types of like resources. Um, one thing I will say is that there is actually a massive maker movement in Alberta. So if you're looking at building prototypes and fabricating, there are quite a few um, small maker spaces um, that can be open access to community. There's also um, a prototyping lab at the Life Sciences Innovation Hub. And um, so it just it depends on the kind of the scale of uh, production that you're looking at. Um, but a challenging one for me to address, uh, Jane. This, so that was my face. It wasn't, a, I have the answer. <laughs> there are, um, I mean, it comes down to how do you find anything? How do you find money? How do you find anything? It's, uh, and I've been surprised lately at about um, how many more fabricators are kind of sticking their heads up above the walls of the trenches in, in Alberta. Uh, we had put some money into a company that was looking that thought they were going to have to source overseas. And it turns out that once they started asking the question, well, where did you get that thing um, to other people who had similar um, items that they were looking for, they found local suppliers or found suppliers that were closer. It, it comes down to uh, taking a look at where other people got things. Same as taking a look at where did other people get money? How did other people use our loans? Take a look at where the uh, thing that you need fabricated is coming from. We, we lost a lot of local production, of course, when globalization became the thing, but are now discovering that, you know, those extended supply chains are maybe not the best for a whole lot of different reasons. Um, we've also we've also put money recently into a couple of um, companies that are going to start manufacturing unlikely things here. So I think I think some of the the uh, the world is turning around a bit. Uh, a war in Europe has made some people sit up and take notice. Uh, people who have tried manufacturing things in China and lost intellectual property are beginning to change their minds about where they want to do things. And so it's it it it's kind of sometimes the only thing it's that slogging old research. Um, and then the other piece of that is, well, who do you know that's doing it? Or even if you don't know who they are and you see it, then call them up and ask where did you get who is providing um and i'm sure that some of the the government incubators and some of the other sorts of um company development um resources that are starting me to develop um could help you too so can can platform help you can some of the other organizations here so the business schools who do they know that might be able to support you um, in what it is you're trying to find. So that's where I'd, that's where I'd start. Yeah, I threw a few in the chat box to think about. So I threw um, Fuse 33, which is a makerspace here, here in Calgary. Um, the other one is I was thinking about be local. Calgary might have some leads in terms of who might be working in this space locally. They're uh, part of Momentum. So they work with a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, and then the last one, Amy, you brought this one up in the chat box, but also by Social Canada, I believe one of their searches they have is actually like uh, pro like producing things, built like mm -hmm. manufacturing things. Um, I haven't gone in depth on that website um, or that specific search, but that might be a place to look as well. Chat is awesome. It's like blowing up. So great. <laughs> um, 
I guess one thing I thought about, and maybe you panelists know, at least for a prototype, does the library not have a makerspace? The public library. We do here in Edmonton, I know. Yeah, I'm wondering if the Calgary Central, no? Okay, I'm mistaken then. Okay, well, then we'll add it to our wish list for our library. And maybe one final question or clarification from the audience if we have something. There, there was one that came up in the chat box, oh, Alia, yes. around are there any um, like social entrepreneurship related yes, meetups yes, or networking right. groups? Um, Jordana, do you want to take that one and maybe talk about the social innovation hub at this point with respect to that? Sure. Yeah, I think there were a few um, that were dropped in the chat. There's a LinkedIn page that folks can join. Um, Alberta Seed um, has a, I think now has a social entrepreneur networking group, which we can clarify. Um, and uh, and then, uh, as Alia asked, um, so at Innovate Calgary, we've just launched, launched the Social Innovation Hub. It is actually very specifically called the Social Innovation Hub um, because for us, we're looking at both uh, approaches and, um, and end products um, that are creating uh, systems transformation and, and uh, trying to solve uh, complex social problems. Um, but I will say that one of the key things that we're trying to do through that space is to create a community where like-minded innovators can come together. And we had very much heard from the community that we've been working with over the, the last decade. You know, there isn't really a, a meeting spot for people who are intentionally creating that social impact. And so, um, you know, please reach out, um, follow up and uh, come test out the space. We've got some community programming um, to allow uh, entrepreneurs and innovators um, to uh, test out. Um, so Ali, I think you said you had the links to that. Um, and then also just wanted to mention um, for any uh, BIPOC female founders on the call or those you know of, um, we are looking for uh, folks who are interested in pitching at our up upcoming uh, BIPOC founders pitch competition. And I believe that will be hosted in our space, but I may be wrong about that. I guess we've launched into our round table um, as we like to do at the end of each of these sessions to give the chance to the panelists to share things that they're working on and that might be of interest to you. Um, all right, so before I do the round table, just a reminder that April 12th is our next Amaze. I will put the link for that in the chat as well so that you can join us again. Oh, why'd you say oops? Oh no, totally fine. I think it was a nice segue. Um, I just wanted to make sure I read my notes so I didn't forget things. Okay, so Brittany, do you have any other updates or closing thoughts? Uh, nothing new. I always plug our assess materials that are on our website. Like I said, they're free, available 24 seven. We've tried to put everything kind of accessible and recorded. Um, that 20 minute video that I shared earlier is a really great like dip your toe into water around how we talk about this stuff. So feel free to check that out and then reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, Jane. I don't think I've got anything necessarily that hasn't popped up somewhere else other than this say thank you for the interesting round of questions. We kind mm -hmm. of went from one, swung from one area to another and I, I really enjoy that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Jordana, anything to add? No. Yeah, just to echo Jane's thank you. It's been a great conversation and um, encouraging anyone on the call to, I think, reach out to any one of us at any point if, if there are follow on questions that emerge or come to the next session and bring them there. Yes, um, everyone's email is actually on the website. So when you register, you can figure out how to get in touch with everybody. And last but not least, Dan, any final thoughts? I'm good. I am saying welcome back. Thank you. I'm happy to be back. Um, yeah, so thank you for coming to our March Amaze. We look forward to seeing you in April or seeing you not one-to-one -one when you're on YouTube because that's also where these uh, recordings go. I posted the uh, link to our playlist also in the chat. So um, if you're not seeing the chat and you want any of these links, please reach out to me and I can send them to you via email. 
uh, because we have some guests here today that are calling by phone and so can't see the chat. And so with that, I wish you a very happy evening, wonderful evening, happy March. We're almost spring, we're getting there. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>